Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, on the internet, I'm Vis. Uh, I'm going to be presenting today about uh, some camera-related silliness regarding basically watching the war in Ukraine unfold live from my couch at home in San Diego. Um, so it gets, gets pretty colorful pretty fast. So, uh, very quick, who am I? Uh, a lot of people like using this slide to talk about their vocational accolades and where they worked and cool stuff they did. And I'm like, no, these are my hobbies. I make hot sauce, I fly quads, I consulted for Mr. Robot and, and uh, Watch Dogs 2. I used to do sysadmin and network stuff before I turned into a security guy. Um, and largely, I'm just kind of a loud mouth on the internet. So it's, it's a fun time uh, and it makes for, uh, uh, you know, uh, colorful weekends. So, a uh, very quick, uh, like a brief sort of overview of the things that I'm going to be covering today uh, is essentially uh, a brief history of how I keep getting sucked into the world of cameras. Uh, not that I'm particularly aiming for that, I just keep finding myself there somehow, magically. Uh, and uh, sort of uh, some techniques on how to discover cameras, um, uh, discovering Russian information uh, tactics and techniques uh, by finding cameras that were doing one thing today or yesterday and doing another thing today. Um, failed attempts at doing camera consolidation, because what happens when you find like 40 or 50 cameras in another country that are interesting? And how do you grapple with that? What do you do with them? Um, the sort of caveats for how to maintain that system and how to deal with it. Uh, and then some cool other sort of remote sensing techniques that we discovered along the way that were cool, and then some practical applications. So, um, essentially covering this brief history uh, with regards to the prevalence of webcams uh, is a good, I good way to sort of warm folks up to, to get into this uh, methodology. So I began, it's all started for me in like 2012. Uh, I read a blog post on this website called Council, Con Console Cowboys where um, a guy owned a webcam and he decided to see what sort of shenanigans he could get up to with it. So he basically downloaded the firmware and then used a tool called Binwalk to unroll the firmware. And he has a really colorful blog post that describes it. Uh, and I. Uh, read that and uh, said, well, I'm not much of a dev, but that seems pretty straightforward. And, and you know, Binwalk has come a long way since. But essentially, you download a firmware from the internet and you run Binwalk against it and it just gives you a directory full of stuff. And sometimes that directory full of stuff has very colorful uh, little diamonds in it. Um, but yeah, it, very colorful, very interesting. Uh, and I found a whole bunch of what is now called IDOR, or I indirect object reference vulnerabilities, where, for example, you have a camera, and if you know what the URL to the camera's video feed is, and you go to that directly, you don't get prompted for authentication. So you may have default password, or you may have no password, or you may have change the password, but none of that matters, because if you know what the URL is to the picture, you can just go to it directly. So that's fun. Um, and so I, I built a talk about that uh, in 2013 and took that to a conference. And uh, this command line here, that's a one line of bash, which is ridiculous. And, and I'm, I really love bash for this reason, because this one, um, this one line of bash grabs everything from Shodan up to 1,000 findings that says uh, if the product is Oracle WebLogic on a certain port, um, sorts it, pipes it to nmap to check if the port is open. If it's open, then it uses awk and then xargs to basically create 30 threads of a bash command line, which runs a curl command, which checks the, uh, the endpoint that has been discovered to see if the vulnerability it's looking for exists. And if it does exist, it does some fun color coding and says, yes, you found the thing, and then it just dumps it to standard out. So like in one line of bash, you can scan the whole internet, do an nmap, like it's stupid, I love it, it's fantastic. Like this is, everyone else is writing ML, AI, quantum computing, and here's me with one line of bash. Um, so it's like old school sysadmin mode, like if you were a sysadmin like between 2000 and 2005, like those skills don't exist in the world much anymore. So all this stuff is what lives under like your $250,000 next generation firewall appliance. That's what it's doing under the hood. Uh, so that's pretty fun. Um, but this is really neat. Uh, this sort of technique is really neat in terms of like you can go from I found a thing to I can scan the whole internet for this thing with <laughs> with one line of bash, presuming you have the bandwidth to do it. So um, this gets colorful really quickly because generally speaking, a lot of people that put cameras on the internet don't put them behind VPNs, they don't put them behind firewalls, or they just they trust the vendor, which tends to be sort of a dicey proposition from the get go. So we fast forward seven years, and I'm living in this townhouse in San Diego, and the neighbor next door to me is running a prostitution recruitment depot out of his apartment. And the problem is that my front door is here, and his front door is there. And these people are showing up at like four in the morning, and they, they might be high, who knows. They don't know which door is which. 
So like I'm woken up at three in the morning because somebody's trying to walk into my house. So like I had to learn very quickly um, how to grapple with this scenario. Um, so like this was this like these guys associates like this guy on the left. Um, he stood out front of this dude's door for three hours, pounding on the door and screaming and shouting because apparently there was something wrong. By then, they, the, the guy had gone. Um, but uh, that was fun to have to deal with. Uh, and then this other guy on the right, um, I and this was after I had set up all my cameras because of some of this other shenaniganry, watched him carry weapons into and out of this guy's apartment. And I'm like, well, um, so yeah, like uh, that was the sort of going back in time, this like arc of events is a really good measure of why you spend the good money on the nice cameras that have high resolution and good frame rates and can see faces and can, you know, this is why you spend $400 or $500 on like a good axis camera and not like $30 on the Amcrest one. Because when you need to hear what they're saying or you need to see a face or you need to see what they're carrying, like your, your garbage grade sensor, uh, that's what'll get you. So like there's one thing to say, I want a cheap camera just to see if there's somebody there doing anything. That's one thing. And you know, oh, this camera will make me feel better and I won't, I won't break the bank. But if it has to go to the police, the police can't help you if it's uh, if what you're showing them is is like a, a like a, a fu like a Monet painting. It's just like a smear. Like oh yeah, there's a guy and he's doing something. Or it could be a smudge on the lens. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, it gets to be like well, you have to start thinking about this stuff um, uh, seriously uh, when you reach that stage. Um, so at the time, uh, what I was doing was running multiple cameras, and each camera was. Um, capturing images and sending them to an email server that I was running in my house. So I would look at my phone and emails would roll in and those emails would have like JPEG attachments. And I thought that was kind of cool. And with one or two cameras, that's not that big of a deal unless you're in an airport or a foreign country where you don't have good data services because the minute you open your email client and you're like, I want to see what's going on at my house. And you you know, you say check mail and then it takes four hours to download, you know, 200K of email messages because you're getting your internet through a drinking straw. Uh, then that sort of, it sort of bites you. Um, or what happens if there's a tree, like the cheap cameras can't tell the difference between a human being and like the shadow on the floor from a tree branch that's swaying in the wind. And when that happens, because it's like high winds in San Diego one day, suddenly you get like 400 megs of email that floods your inbox of like a, a branch. You're like, wow, this is great. I spent all that time and money. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, so uh, that was me getting, getting bitten for taking the cheap route. So I started investigating, okay, well, how do I grapple with this? Like, these are practical problems I'm trying to solve. What, do I do? what can I do next? So I started looking around. I got, I got annoyed enough to start investigating. And uh, I found um, these are two software packages that I discovered. On the, on the left, there's one called Blue Iris, which is like a software that you can put on a Windows box. Uh, and it's $60 or something like that. And it has like your typical sort of DVR um, functionality where you, you aim it at RTSP URLs for cameras and it'll do things like motion detection and all sorts of stuff. But, but they wanted money and I didn't want to spend a lot and that was my mistake. And then on the right, there's another one that I discovered called Shinobi, which uh, looks a lot cooler and smoother. It's got, got HTML5, it's, it's open source. Um, and I discovered very recently that uh, they made a Docker instance of it, which was cool. At the time, this was all close to 10 years ago, um, there, that was like a software package you'd have to install in an Ubuntu box. And then there's, it basically, it's a, it's a really colorful, uh, fancy wrapper for a mountain of FFmpeg calls. And FFmpeg, if you've ever had to mess with FFmpeg, is if you've ever dealt with a piece of software that will get angry at you and actually like use words to complain at you that you've done something wrong, like that's FFmpeg. FFmpeg will tell you that you should complain to the camera manufacturer because the packet stream coming out of the RTSB feed from the camera isn't to FFmpeg's liking. Like FFmpeg is the Karen of software. It's absurd. Like seriously. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's pretty wild. Um, but yeah, I looked at both of these and Blue Iris cost money and I didn't want to pay and Shinobi was cool, but... Um, it doesn't have, I haven't checked recently, but it doesn't have good um, PTZ control. So if you have a camera that can, you can drive around or zoom or whatever, Shinobi doesn't even have the, you have to like manually map the buttons to like the button to move the camera to the right is this API call and you have to give it like a author, authorization bearer token and like, and I'm like, you know, I just want to drive the camera around. I wasn't planning on pro, like really that's way too much overhead for just driving a camera around. So I'm like, oh, that's silly. Um, so I continued to investigate, and um, I discovered that QNAP and Synology, which are both like NAS appliance vendors, 
they have, like as a bonus add-on, they have uh, camera control software uh, built into the NAS. So it's sort of double trouble, which works out really well. So you have like you have your NAS and you aim your cameras at it, or I guess the other way around, you aim the software at the cameras and it imbibes all the video and it does all the heavy lifting on a piece of hardware. So you're not having to individually manage you know, 20 different cameras settings of things. Oh, well, okay, that's pretty handy. Um, but the buy-in is, you know, 10, you know, 10, 20 times more. So instead of paying $60 for a piece of software, you're paying several thousand dollars for a piece of hardware. And oftentimes you're paying several thousand dollars for hardware before you even put disks in it. So like, this is like the big boy route. This is like, okay, well, I have a small office or a business or something, and I, I have a lot of cameras to deal with. So on the left, we have QNAP's solution. And on the right, we have Synology. And I ended up going with Synology. So like my current setup is Synology with a obscene, absurd, like people will probably refer me to a, a psychologist number of cameras. Um, but yeah, fun times. Um, so beyond those, everything else is kind of roll your own, right? So there's, there's this like free open source uh, scale, and then there's like the Grand Canyon of nothing, and then like I'm willing to spend $5,000 or more. And there's not a lot in between. And, and everything, like that in between section is if you're handy with writing code, which I am, if, if you saw me write Python, you'd slap me and you'd be right to. Um, uh, if you want to roll your own, there's a lot of stuff you can do. And, and in this case, this is a screenshot of a, of a command line tool called RTSP Brute. But that's not even video. That's literally just a snapshot in time of like single images. Um, you, you aim this tool at a, you know, a litany of cameras and it'll grab imagery uh, from them and put them in a little gallery. And if you click the image, then it'll give you the RTSP path and you can like paste that into VLC and you can watch one camera at a time. Which is cool for like proof of concept. Like I, I found a bunch of cameras, I wanna eyeball them to see if there's anything interesting because that's how you sort of triage your findings to decide what do I actually care about? Like, are the cameras doing anything interesting, right? Um, and that's largely what exists today in the sort of ecosystem. Um, so, like, it's one thing, you know, to, going back to my example where I have a practical application where I need three or four or five cameras because I have this crazy neighbor that I was blessed with. Um, that, uh, yeah, it was fun. We, this, rum, just rum is good. Um, but uh, what do you do when you have 40 or 50 cameras, right? Like, it gets unwieldy pretty quickly. And then to that end, then you have all these other considerations I'll get into later, like bandwidth and storage and CPU and RAM and all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, let's say you do this and you find a bunch of cameras that you like, like how, how do you grapple with those findings? So uh, fast forward to like, be, like middle of February, um, uh, the world is, uh, discovers that there's tanks driving across the border from Russia into Ukraine uh, and suddenly everybody glues themselves to the news. And now this is like, as far as I know, the first conflict of this nature to exist in a world where absolutely everyone has what in the 90s would be considered a supercomputer with like a full litany of sensors of uh, cameras and mics and Wi-Fi and you can do all sorts of... Wet. This is like... When I was a kid, I played Doom on a computer that had like four megabytes, four megs of RAM. And now the pictures that I take on my phone how, uh, are consume more space than some of the hard drives that used to exist back then. So like, um, uh, it's interesting to, to think that there's conflicts and everybody has a smartphone on them and uh, that gives you this bizarre ability to do sensing of a variety of types. So uh, while things are happening, we're all looking at the news and um, I did what a lot of other people did, which was uh, I wonder if there are like touristy type webcams. Like, so in San Diego, there's a vendor called um, HD on Tap, and their whole business model is literally we will install a fancy high resolution camera with a nice microphone somewhere on your business, and uh, you can aim it at something that looks pretty, or if you're you know, at a zoo, you can aim it at the animals, or if you're running like a, a like we have a, a San Diego Wild Animal Park is this world famous place where they do like conservation of animals and plants and stuff. So they have like eagles and, and vultures and things that they're trying to like bring the numbers up. Uh, and they'll have like a fancy high resolution 4K camera of like birds' nests and stuff. So like animal people can watch that sort of thing. Well, you people can set up puppy cams or whatever. So certainly, you know, you would expect that places that are trying to atta attract tourists would use cameras as a me mechanism to say, look, our place looks neat or cool or swell. You should come and spend money at this place that you visually are attracted to. Uh, and it totally works. And the interesting thing was, yes, absolutely. There were probably half a dozen of these uh, tourist cameras that were put in like Maiden Square and Freedom Square and all these other places that were like commonly used as sort of tourist attractions where people now go and take selfies. Um, and you could sit and what I was doing was basically three Chrome windows with YouTube 
um, uh, videos on my projector while I was sat in my living room on my laptop, like sort of like war room style, just like watching. And one of the cameras was actually kind of cool. It has a high resolution mic with one of those wind guards on it. So you could get ambient sound from somewhere else in the world. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. Like, I'm not looking at people necessarily, but like being able to get sound from building on high, it's like standing on a roof somewhere. You can hear for literally miles around and you can tell if stuff is happening. And because you can see the horizon and you have a view of the sky and the clouds, you can see if sort of stuff blowing up in the distance, like you're going to see lights and stuff. So that's, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I should probably investigate like what other cameras of this nature are around. So it was sort of casually keeping the interesting ones open and then spending some time um, on the internet sort of perusing around trying to find um, uh, trying to find uh, cameras of that nature which are like high resolution cameras on the top of roofs or on the top of apartment buildings looking at like the horizon essentially. Um, so let's see if this works. There's Ah, video. Okay, good. Does it work? Okay, so hopefully uh, if we have audio um, where's my cursor? There it is. Um, this was particularly interesting. So before I hit play, because uh, the audio is going to matter, uh, on the top left is one of those cameras I was talking about that's like high resolution camera, a nice microphone, things like that. On the bottom left is the live feed of the BBC. And the other two cameras were just other parts of uh, Ukraine uh, that were just live cameras just to see stuff. Um, the camera on the top left uh, was particularly interesting to me because while I couldn't see much other than like the top of a church nearby, um, the audio was the interesting part because if you just sat there watching this thing, you could hear a metal door open and close, and then you could hear British people talking. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. And if you listen to them talk enough, uh, you can tell that they were reporters. So reporters were apparently going onto this roof and using that view as sort of their backdrop to do their segments. And uh, I discovered entirely by chance, entirely happenstance, that that camera uh, was a tourist camera with a mic that the BBC didn't know was there, or they didn't know was like hot mic'd. And they were doing their segments uh, where they were like their correspondent in the bulletproof vest was st standing on the roof talking to the BBC live next to that camera. So uh, let's see if we can get audio here. Let's see if it works. Does it work? Maybe? We get lucky? No, there's no audio. Oh. Well, uh, I guess. Can we get audio from the, from the laptop? Maybe? There's supposed to be stuff here. It's... Oh, is it? Nope, it's all the way up. There we go. Okay, so I'll restart it. So this is really interesting. Pay attention to the uh, when you can see, hopefully you can see the mouse cursor. When I click on the video on the top left, you'll hear people talking. And then um, you'll click on the video, or I'll click on the video on the bottom left, and you'll hear them talking. And there's about a five to 10 second delay. Um, so the whole thing is about two minutes long, but this gets pretty wild. So when I saw this, I, had, I just whipped my phone out of my pocket because I couldn't figure out a faster way to record this because this was live. And it's, I wasn't set up to like push a big red button and record everything live. So this is pretty great. Uh. Oops. Uh-oh. There we go. Okay. Uh. Well, we suddenly understood that the success of the art makes them to a language of the state. But before I did that, Will he even let me do that? Yeah, look at that. Before I, I went live, I said, look, you know, tell us who's in control of this now. Is it the Russians in control or is it the Ukrainians? And they said, it's the Russians. And I said, well, where are the Russians then? Um, you know, if that's the case. Then that video there were Russian. You know, they, they, you know, there were no Ukrainian troops around there. I, I said, he said, he said, where are Russians? I was like, well, Russians. He's like, Yaroski. You know, I am Russian, he was saying to me. Um, and I looked at his armband, and they had these orange and black armbands on. White bands on their on their arms. Those are actually Russians. Now, all, all those troops you saw in that video there were Russian. You know, they, the, you know, there were no Ukrainian troops around there. I, I said, he said, he said, where are Russians? I was like, you're right. So, Yaros, you know, I am Russian, he was saying to me. Um, and I looked at his armband, and they had these orange and black armbands on the ribbons on, which is sort of some George ribbon. Very sort of common in the in the Russian military, symbol of the Russian military. Yeah, he did. He did say that. Uh, he said that in a, in a, a public address that he's put out on social media an hour or so ago. Uh, 
you may have been talking about those sabotage groups, you may have been talking about those Russian special forces, because the concern now is, of course, it's been expressed by the US Secretary of State, it's been expressed by Ukrainian officials here, is that the plan for Russia may be to come in and not, not just encircle Kiev, but to come in and decapitate the leadership. He's put out on social media an hour or so ago. Uh, you may have been talking about those sabotage groups, you may have been talking about those Russian special forces, because the concern now is of course it's been expressed by the US Secretary of State and expressed by Ukrainian officials here, is that the plan for Russia may be to come in and not, not just encircle Kiev, but to come in and decapitate the leadership and to replace the government here with a pro-Moscow administration. Um, uh, Zelensky... Uh... Yeah. So it got really interesting really quickly. Like, uh, where are we going here? Uh, can I... Yeah. But yeah, um, so at that moment, it was like, okay, uh, now we're looking at, uh, come on, come on. well, we suddenly understood. Oh, that's weird. There we go. Okay. We'll go to the next slide. There. Okay. Yeah. So fun time. So in that moment, suddenly, uh, things got really colorful, really fast. Um, so once that happened, I'm like, okay, I got to find more of these cameras because now this is pretty wild because now I have like live, live video from the ground in Ukraine, like in an active war zone. Uh, and I'm ac accidentally getting behind the scenes audio from, you know, BBC newscast. And that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess they, they did notice eventually because about three or four days later, that camera kind of disappeared. Uh, I must not have been the only person that had discovered that because that was like just live on YouTube. Like you go on YouTube and you can like filter by live. Uh, and that, that was up. So why that was there, I'm guessing it was, you know, touristy something, something, but it turned into uh, uh, pretty interesting from like a reconnaissance, o open source intelligence uh, pr perspective very fast. So there was another uh, organization called Skyline Webcams that, that was, I guess, one of the sort of the parent organization that um, kept track of all of the um, live high resolution webcams in Ukraine. And they had a ton of them. And what I noticed when I started watching those was that they would slowly drop offline, like two or three at a time. And then RT and Reptly would stand up cameras with the same exact video feeds. Uh, and you would think that you're looking at the same thing. But you know, if you look at Twitter, for example, um, there are, there's accounts on Twitter that are doing uh, OSN that are dedicated to the whole Ukrainian invasion, um, or the invasion of Ukraine, rather. And uh, they are doing like minute-to-minute -minute updates of, oh, this part of the country is being bombed, there's skirmishes and fighting here, or there's air raid sirens in this city or that city. So I'd say, like, okay, well, we have a bunch of high-resolution video cameras with microphones in a city somewhere, and Twitter is saying that there's supposed to be air raid sirens going off, but there's no air raid sirens on the audio in these cameras at all. So uh, you look at the old uh, account, and the old account is like Skyline Webcams, and the new account is like RT and Reptly. Well, RT and Reptly is Russia. So what Russia was doing was going a week into the past and getting 24 hours of video in a loop, and then using, I, I don't know, if it were me, I'd use something like OBS, to like take that stream and feed it back to YouTube and call it a live stream. So now you're showing, you're doing like what Hollywood does in the movies. You're taking old video footage and playing it as live, uh, to obfuscate the fact that like the real live cameras have bad stuff happening on them, but Russia wants to not uh, not take ownership of of their own invasion, so um, they have these uh, pieces of video footage that they're uh, putting on a loop uh, that I ended up looking at for a couple of days, saying this is bizarre. Why like people on Twitter are posting videos of stuff like like I guess there's Telegram channels that folks there have been using to spread uh, video clips of stuff happening so that people can see what's going on. Uh, so there's like video clips of people that are you know a block away from the action posting stuff, but the live cameras are like everything's happy and there's birds and ice cream trucks, and I'm like uh no. So I'm like, okay, well, this is dumb. How do I, how do I continue monitoring stuff and not accidentally uh, fall into disinformation um, that's being published by invaders? Um, so I started scanning the entire country myself because that's sort of my thing. Um, so um, I scanned the entirety of the Ukrainian IP address space to find publicly uh, open RTSP cameras. Uh, and I... The first scan was something like 4 million IPs. Of those 4 million, several hundred thousand were actually up. And of those several hundred thousand that were up, there were about 47,000 that were actually RTSP endpoints that were acknowledging that, yes, hi, I'm a camera on the internet. And out of those 47,000, only about 2,000 or maybe 2,500 were actually cameras that were live that we could like look at that weren't password protected, that we could uh, uh, you know, 
peruse through. So I went back to the glory days of uh, sweeping the internet for cameras to see, like, does the old technique still work? And yes, it absolutely totally does. Uh, and there's been a lot of interesting, colorful new developments since. Um, so I used a tool called RTSP Brute to basically, uh, well, I used a combination of, like, several steps, right, to find you do a, a sweep. For example, I did, you know, grabbing IPs from Shodan, validating those IPs, IPs were up, and then taking the resulting, like, known good list of cameras and handing that to RTSP Brute, which then produces this little uh, mosaic. Uh, and that was, the, that was the sort of end result, but, like, I'll take you through... Uh, uh, some of the colorful, uh, horrible fails that happened before this. Um, so the objective here with this, again, was not like, I had no interest in looking at like people's homes or inside businesses, and there was tons of those, like uh, cameras monitoring people's driveways and backyards and like co uh, coffee shops and restaurants and retail stores. And those might be interesting for some other use case, but in, in my, in my uh, efforts here, I was specifically looking for stuff largely like cameras on rooftops, cameras on tall apartment buildings, because I wanted a view of the horizon, because that's how you see interesting stuff. Um, so this, if you've ever messed with VLC, VLC has this, I think this is another one of these like open source authors writing stuff to punish their users kind of deals. The uh, VLC has a thing called an RTSP mosaic that you can do. And the RTSP mosaic is um, uh, you create essentially an XML file and you give it all the parameters of the videos in the XML file and it will take like a single screen of VLC and it will tile the videos across that screen. Uh, and it works great for about, 10 seconds until one camera drops offline for a bit and then it turns into Microsoft Word where everything gets jumbled up and you can't get your original format back and everything, you just want to burn the world and kick a chair around the room. Um, so I, I burned about three days on that and that's why I have gray hair now. Um, and then I abandoned that pretty quickly and tried to do uh, something else. So yeah, zero out of 10, would not research again. Uh, VLC is fun for watching movies, but don't, R the RTSP mosaic thing is, it's ancient and apparently nobody's touched it or updated it in like 15 years, so oof. But yeah, so. Uh, it got interesting pretty quickly when I started discovering cameras that was like, this one here on the left is a Ukrainian soldier walking up to a doorbell, because apparently there's like doorbell cameras that are just on the internet facing outward into the street. That camera actually turned out pretty cool. The, the initial um, image from my first slide with that APC sit side against the uh, fog, that came from that camera. Which incidentally, that camera's not online anymore, but it was about a block from Zelensky's HQ, which that was three days of doing OSN and driving around um, driving around Google Maps to try and figure out uh, where the camera actually was. Because th there's a whole other component to this after the fact of like, now that you have a whole bunch of cameras that are interesting, where are they? Where are they pointing? What can they see? Can you put them on a map? And then there's all sorts of colorful stuff you can do after that. But like, the cameras are interesting uh, in of themselves if you look at them, but it gets way more interesting if you can geolocate them. Um, but uh, yeah, so in this case, uh, like, so the VLC component was like, uh, it was snapshot on time. You could only see what was happening live. There was no real right way to record. You couldn't do motion detection, anything like that. So I abandoned the whole VLC thing and ended up um, trying to go back to uh, Shinobi. And it turns out that if you don't have to drive cameras around with PTZ, Shinobi is actually pretty cool. And now, because Docker, we live in the future, um, Shinobi is available as a Docker container. So you don't have to do a bunch of kludgy, messy uh, setup by hand. You just drop Docker in, light up Shinobi, and then you just start feeding it cameras and you have that. Uh, but then you have all the extra added features of like motion detection and being able to like um, uh, store video on disk and roll back time and things like that. Uh, but uh, like any other open source project, it comes with caveats. And the problem with, uh, with uh, Shinobi is that it is, like I said earlier, a uh, very colorful, interesting wrapper for FFmpeg. And FFmpeg is a very angry piece of software. FFmpeg uh, will create dozens and dozens or hundreds and hundreds of zombie processes. Because if you're trying to talk to cameras across like multiple oceanic links, the, the TCP stream isn't always stable. And if it crashes or the TCP, if the data lands in uh, uh, FFmpeg that it doesn't like, it creates a zombie process. And what happens when you have like 7,000 zombie processes on your machine? Well, your machine has a bad day. Uh, so um, in this case, I actually had to write a wrapper script to uh, handle this whole process of the camera solution that I was running was creating zombie processes and denial of servicing the machine that I put it on. So uh, I now have this colorful wrapper script, which basically like counts the number of zombie processes, and when it reaches a certain number, it like bounces the Docker container, uh, which then has follow-on issues because 
the Shinobi is recording 15 minute segments. And if something interesting happens inside that 15 minute segment and you call a restart during that 15 minute recording, you lose that segment. So I'm like, well, fantastic. Now we have like fun tech, other people's technical debt that I get to go deal with. Um, but yeah, uh, the other thing is that browsers, um, browsers can't do RTSP like at all. Like they'll, like browsers will do uh, MP4s and they'll do uh, FLV, FLV is ancient, and so, several other video formats. But from like a dealing with video perspective, browsers don't do RTSP. You have to like wrap it in something or transcode it on the fly. So uh, that's what Shinobi does. It, it, it imbibes the RTSP streams from the cameras and then translates that to um, HLS, I think is the format uh, that it's using at the minute, uh, so that your browser can actually see it. And that transcoding process happens using FFmpeg. Um, and so anytime it, there's a hiccup or it chokes at all, you get zombie process, so that's fun. Um, but yeah, here's that, here's that uh, doorbell camera again. So that's a pretty wild thing to be able to just see and watch as shift changes when you see like troop movements and things like that. Um, nothing particularly interesting happened on the camera. Like, thankfully, I didn't, like, there's no craziness. I didn't have to see ugly war things. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's just wild to be able to, to aim computers at another country and see this stuff just because it's on the internet completely public. Uh, this thing stayed up for about two months before it went offline. I imagine that I wasn't, actually, I know that I wasn't the first person to, to um, go look. But some of the other things that uh, I had discovered before they went offline were like this entire bottom row here. These are uh, dash cams that are connected to the internet with zero authentication, exposing uh, a front-facing and a rear-facing camera that uh, these things are connected and powered by the car's battery. So if you pop these things open in VLC, you can watch these guys driving around. You can like listen to them talk because the camera system is inside the car um, mounted to the dashboard or uh, suction cup to the window or the uh, uh, w windshield. And uh, I guess these were like a private security company that had like the volunteers that were working or the people that were working for the private security company had volunteered to be like part of the the d defense forces, like the volunteers. So then now they're all in body armor with AK-47s driving around trying to, you know, uh, see something, say something, or see something, shoot something. Uh, and those were up for a little while, and they, they, they all went offline. Um, the top left is uh, a camera that I think uh, was three or four police stations in Dnipro because uh, the format was all the same. The name was in the bottom right, and the timestamp was in the top left, and everybody was wearing the same uniforms. Um, we got to watch them set up sandbags. And again, no nothing particularly interesting happened, but it was just fun to be able to see this live. Like, it's not every day you pop open a webcam on the internet, and there's, like, dudes with assault rifles hanging out on camera. And on the top right, that's, um, if you look at a map of Kiev, uh, in the bottom right-hand part of the city, there's a train station, and th I guess this was a construction site that had turned their camera around towards the... Uh, the, the city and the light is like some kind of shelling was happening and the video processing that I'd been doing at the time captured this on video. So I couldn't tell what was happening because the, the uh, video was fairly low resolution but stuff was exploding and it was causing light to be thrown into the sky. So it was like you could watch this live on this camera and then look at Twitter and in 15 minutes you would start seeing people screaming about how there's um, shelling happening and take cover and air raid sirens and that sort of stuff. So it was bizarre to be like ahead of the curve um, in that sort of scenario. Um, but uh, this was, uh, if you remember the, the big thing where the, the um, TV antenna took artillery and that made the news and that was a big deal. Uh, I caught that. Uh, and this is the video from my system that live caught the uh, shelling happening. This was a camera on an apartment building uh, a couple of miles away, uh, and this was like really zoomed in because you can probably see the pixels are this big. Um, but uh, uh, this is one of these like it happened. So I'm in in San Diego in Pacific time. So this happened while I was asleep, but because the system had been recording the video and based on the number of cameras and the uh, resolution that I was storing stuff at, I was able to go back in time about six days. Uh, so if anything interesting happened that made the news, I could roll back time and go and see if I can like match the timestamp of the camera to where the news article was and, and figure out like what happened. So in this case, you could see like, yep, they're, they're trying to bomb the, the TV antenna. Um, this camera is also sadly offline, but this is one of the more interesting ones. Um, uh, this was also pretty colorful and interesting. This camera is actually still alive. Um, this is a camera in a city that's uh, east of Kyiv, aimed at Kyiv. The resolution is pretty low, but you can see like in that top left uh, frame, um, there's some kind of rockets being launched uh, and then they impact stuff in the sky. You can't really tell what's going on, kind of, sort of, but then like you see this and then five minutes later, 10 minutes later on Twitter, you see people um, talking about how Ukraine just shot down um, a Russian MiG. 
Um, well, that's pretty interesting. And then here in the bottom right, you can see like some kind of fire, or the bottom left rather, you can see some kind of fire happening. And then on the right, you can see kind of looks like fireworks. And at the time, I had no idea what that was or what was happening. Uh, and then like three weeks later, I start seeing video like this landing on Twitter from, from people on the internet sharing video up close. And that's Russia shooting uh, white phosphorus. And it looks like fireworks, but that it's really bad for you when it lands. It, it, designed to kill people. Um, but from a distance, it looks like fire. And at the time, I had no idea what it was, but I'm guessing, like, the, I'm thinking that it's hard to tell, right? Like, the Ukrainians are firing on the left, and then, like, that's the impact zone for, like, Russia firing on the right. Because if you look at a map of where this was, this camera is facing west, and at the time, Russia was north of Kyiv, and Kyiv is kind of, like, center frame there. So off to the right would be north of Kyiv. So it's like, okay, well, it makes sense from a geographical perspective. But this is sort of what I was after was... I wasn't interested in finding like gruesome, like on the street stuff, but largely just what parts, uh, what cities or parts of Ukraine are under bombardment, what's actually happening, um, like at a high level, what's going on. So these cameras that are aimed at the sky tend to be really colorful and interesting. Uh, and then uh, we started seeing this. Obviously, like I said, I don't think I was the first person there um, because, you know, teenagers need, need their uh, hacker time too, I guess. Uh, this camera here in the bottom left, it says stay safe up the top left. So I guess some like good Samaritan just went and put a note in or whatever. Um, and then um, on the right, there's um, a camera that's uh, glorifying Russia. So like, I guess this is a, somebody in support of Russia found the default credentials to this camera and they're hacking was just putting text, just defacing the camera. And in the top right, which is a bit, a bit so somber, which is a person in their house who has put tape over their windows with the expectation that if artillery lands near them, glass is gonna come shooting into their house. And they're, uh, they've brought their mattress into like, I guess, right in front of their front door uh, and dealing with that. So that's kind of depressing. Um, but uh, I think out of several thousand cameras I had been through, with the exception of like people outside with rifles, there's just nobody. It's bizarre. It's like 28 days later. Like some of these cameras just have literally nothing on them, like empty streets, empty businesses, empty gyms. I found a, like a SeaWorld type place that had like dolphins and stuff, empty. There's just no people. It's bizarre. With the exception, again, of like you get uh, these security cameras, uh, what I believe were police stations with like dudes with guns out front. Um, but occasionally you get a little, a little ray of sunshine, a little bit of comedy relief. Uh, one of the cameras that I had discovered was an RTSP stream of the Ukrainian, like American comedy cartoons and comedy shows, trans, like dubbed in Ukrainian, being uh, just available. Like I, this must have been somebody's personal system or something, but like if you can understand Ukrainian, you can sit and watch cartoons um, from some camera, from some RTSP endpoint in Ukraine. Well, that's, that's kind of amusing. So yeah, they, have, they, they had uh, Bob's Burgers and Rick and Morty and a bunch of stand-up comedian stuff. It's like they're like comedy channel. Um, but uh, then you have like the same thing. You got uh, cameras uh, for every like one pro-Russian uh, camera. They were like 15 or 20 pro-Ukrainian ones. So this one's like, this is Davai Ukraina, which is like, let's go Ukraine. Um, but yeah, there's been a handful of these. So it's largely that's all I've seen from like the defacement thing. So there's uh, the, this whole business with cameras is very uh, binary. Either they work or they don't. And there's not a whole lot of in between. So like if a place is getting shelled, um, generally one of the first things to go is like the power and the internet. So if you have a bunch of really cool cameras in one part of, when I say really cool, I just mean they, they're aimed at interesting things that are uh, informative. Um, but you have a, a bunch of interesting cameras in a place and that place starts taking artillery fire. Well, the power goes away. And if the power goes away, then the camera goes away. Or if the power goes away, the internet infrastructure goes away. Uh, so you just lose whole swaths of cameras. Um, so for the first, you know, four weeks, I had 40, 50 cameras in the system. And, uh, and I'll get into the technical considerations of how to grapple with all that stuff because you need a pretty buff machine to deal with all that transcoding and all the storage too. Um, but now I have like four, maybe. Uh, and that, that uh, last camera, that one of the interesting stuff on it um, is one of those remaining four. But yeah, like when, when a place starts taking fire, well, all the cameras in that frame, if there were any cameras in that frame, are probably toast. Uh, so it's an interesting sort of um, indicator where if you have a bunch of cameras in one part of a city or a country and all of them go offline at once, well, that might be an indicator that they're taking fire. Um, and so like uh, in this case, about, what was it? Um, 
towards the end of March, uh, all these cameras started to fall off, and it was sort of a combination of like physical bombardment and then like the operators of the cameras discovering that the camera was public and then taking them offline, or adding a password where there formerly was no password, uh, or moving the camera to make it no longer interesting. Uh, so then life got in the way for me, and I had to put this project down for several weeks, and when I came back to it, like I used to have 40 cameras, and now like five or six were working, um, but by then, uh, so many people were posting videos to Twitter and to other uh, uh, social media platforms where like um, these are going to be the more interesting ones because these are folks that are there and they'll have video and it's a lot higher resolution. So the stuff that I was after is largely um, sort of an indicator of stuff is happening in that region and it's a lot less, it's, it's more zoomed out, I guess, if you could say. Uh, and then beyond that, um, some really ingenious folks, and this is glorious, this is... Uh, we live in the future, this is fantastic. So this is a web SDR, like somebody has some high powered SDR attached to, this is the University of, Neth University of Netherlands. Um, they have an SDR attached to a website that's like super 90s GeoCities mode, um, where you can tune the SDR and listen to stuff and it's like um, GQRS or, or SDR Sharp with less features but on a website. So you can be any, anywhere in the world and you can browse to this website and you can look at the SDR and if you find you know, in the waterfall, oh hey, there's stuff there, and you click there, you'll hear audio. And what you can see in some of these notes is like Russian the pip, Russian RDL, Russian navy, uh, Russian squeaky wheel. Um, the Russian invaders were using Baofeng cheap $50 hobby radios to invade a country. They weren't using military equipment. And so because they're using completely analog, completely unencrypted open communications, the internet does what the internet does best, which is mess with them. So some of these are recordings of um, people using this system to discover uh, Russians operating on a frequency. And then moments later, the recording turns into a Rickroll. So somebody figured out how to transmit on that same frequency and jam Russian communications in an act of war with rickrolling, which is like, we live in the future, this is absurd. Um, and then there were people like uh, pushing Ukrainian propaganda onto Russian communication channels. Um, and then if you're handy and you can understand Russian, or if you're even more handy than me, you can like open 10 of these things in different tabs and then pipe that into like text to speech or speech to text rather. So then you can have a blotter and then you can search those for keywords. Like you could go nuts with this. If you piped something like this into OpenCV, you could go wild. Um, but uh, like it's insane that you can like today at home from you know, your living room in another country with just a laptop and next to no resources, you can like have eyes and ears into a foreign country. And then to that end, if you can find a way to transmit, you can mess with a, a foreign invading uh, uh, an army because they're using terrible radios. So this is just mind blowing. Like you have to sit down and just be like, wow, we really do live in the future. Um, so uh, um, this was fairly recent. This was May 5th or May, sorry, May 3rd. Um, about a month ago, uh, the Home Assistant Project um, created uh, a hook for what is called Ukraine Alert. And Ukraine Alert is an app that was released that um, it basically gives you like a map of Ukraine and gives you an alert saying this area has air raid sirens going off or this area is under bombardment. So now you can use that because it's an API you can just talk to that's public. If you were handy enough, you could say, oh, well, I have all these cameras and I know that they're in this region. And now I have this API that tells me if the region is taking fire. So if you glue those things together or like monkey island them together, um, you can say, this area is taking bombardment. So these cameras uh, should be the interesting ones that you can maybe float to the top. Or you can say, full screen them or something. Like it's, it's weird to me that you can now say, like Home Assistant will talk to cameras too. I'm not necessarily saying you should use Home Assistant for this because it's not really the right tool. But if you were bored enough, <laughs> you could, you could, you could po point Home Assistant at several of these cameras and then uh, write a rule that said, if um, that region is under bombardment, you can like float them to the top or like push the stream to your phone or like notify it's it's we, we live in the future and it's really weird here um but yeah it's like and, and this is this, this is a month old so even more interesting stuff is coming so um to that end i i wrote a uh again with bash a little two-line bash script that there's a website out there called max mind which will if you get a free api key you can um 
give it an IP or a host name, and it will give you like a geographic or rough geographic uh, readout of where that thing is. So you find an IP, it's a webcam, it seems interesting, it's got stuff on it you want to watch, you want to put it on a map or you want to know where it is, um, you can ask MaxMind and MaxMind will just tell you what city it's in. And generally speaking, that's good enough because you can tell what direction the camera is pointing if you pay attention to the shadows. And there's a bunch of like, if you, if you follow um, Bellingcat on Twitter, they have like courses about how to do this OSN stuff. So you can say based on the position of the sun and where the shadows are, like the camera is aimed generally due west. Uh, and based on this architecture here, or there's this obelisk, like Ukraine really likes their obelisks. They have dozens of them. So if you, oh, it's aimed at an obelisk. Okay, cool. We can see, okay, the camera's here and there's a road. You can take the time to go through and like find cameras. Uh, like this is a, a map that I made on, on Google Maps of where the TV antenna camera was. So the camera is where that big pin was and the um, TV antenna is like, I think it might be just off frame to the top right. But the idea was like the camera was attached to a, an apartment building like on, the, on a really high floor. And so you do that enough times and you end up with this interesting sort of semi-robust scenario where you have a map with like your vectors of where the cameras are pointing and then you have this web SDR. You can listen to crazy stuff happening there. And like you spend a little while doing this stuff and suddenly you have like a Hollywood style like NCIS war room going on in your living room with like you got eyes and ears into a foreign country and multiple cameras. You can roll back time for a week and it's like, Kind of wild what you can do for free now. Uh, imagine if there was a budget. Like imagine if this was, was like a research project or there was like a think tank or something attached to this. Um, so uh, I, I stopped doing this only because the camera started falling off and I thought it was kind of silly to have like 30 cameras on a map where like by the time I finished putting the camera on the map, the camera's not online anymore. Uh, so this is cool for a while, but I guess it has better practical applications for cameras that have a bit more longevity. Um, so... Some considerations if you want to play with this sort of technology yourself is that uh, imbibing RTSP streams and then converting them to a different format and shooting them back out to a browser takes a lot of CPU. So like you're not going to be able to do this with like the lowest tier EC2 free st stuff. You're going to want eight processors. You're going to want a bunch of RAM. Um, uh, you're going to need some resources. Like it's, it's hard to do this part for free. The only reason I was able to do the Shinobi stuff uh, that I was able to do is because we have a really buff work server that we have some backend things running on that's largely sleeping right now with like 48 cores and 256 gigs of RAM. So I, I just gave it to that thing. And I'm not close to pegging the CPU, but I'm hitting like 50% CPU utilization with like 40 cameras on this thing. So stuff to take into account. Um, and uh, the other thing uh, is the networking, right? So if you're sending packets from the west coast of the US to Ukraine, uh, there's a lot of routers and switching equipment between your server and the cameras you're talking to, and stuff goes down a lot, and packets get jumbled around a lot. So like something to consider is like set up a proxy physically in, in a country nearby, and then do, like, do the Shinobi install there, and then watch the Shinobi stream across the internet, because watching that stream is, uh, it's gonna be higher bandwidth, but you're gonna have more stable video. Or even then, collect everything closer physically to wherever it is you're trying to watch, and, um, take into account like global routing or hey maybe Turkey will decide they hate YouTube again and BGP advertise that they're YouTube and now half of Google disappears off the internet because BGP is fun and everyone loves BGP and this is why we all drink. Um, so like inter the internet's weird and, and it's a giant sort of free-for-all so you'll you, that sort of stuff affects your ability to do this kind of research because like suddenly um, you know, an argument an ISP is having somewhere on like the eastern seaboard of the US causes routes to change. And if the routes change, then all your cameras go down because now you can't reach Ukraine anymore. And I'm like, wow, somebody else is having a fight on the internet and my research falls over because of it. So there's stuff like that to take into consideration if you want to do this kind of work. But um, if you don't want to watch another country get invaded and you have a more practical application for this sort of thing, um, let's say you're on a red team, like maybe Jason, uh, and you want to know, hey, um, I would like to know uh, if the cops are going to show up, because I too have been in a position where I was on a red team and the cops showed up with guns and dogs. And it makes for a cool story, but I never want to do that again. That sucks. I do not want to get shot on the job. I'm a dork. I do dork things. I don't do like bullet things. It's like, uh, so um, the concept or conceptually saying like if you're doing like a full, uh, a full spectrum engagement on a customer where they say like do everything to us and maybe you go in over the wire first, uh, if you get their cameras, and that's an interesting topic of discussion because you'll have like a, a litany of different types of camera technologies and camera services that like the, the security guards will use. And usually security guards in the company are like an outsourced thing, like they're a, a 
uh, contract contractors, uh, the company or sometimes the building management people will own the camera system. Um, in almost every circumstance, fun fact, that camera system will export RTSP streams of each camera. So if you have your own, like a Shinobi server, for example, you can export video streams from the camera or th from the building management or the company's camera systems without affecting their ability to do their jobs, without asking for credentials, without having them change what they're doing. So if you're on a red team and you happen to get those credentials or maybe they were kind enough to leave them in a wiki or on a post-it note on their desk or any other place that I have found them, um, you can just ask the camera system, hey, give me all your cameras, and then you can pipe them into your own Shinobi install. So you can be on the red team watching all the cameras, and you can do like that whole, like, what was that movie, Italian Job, the Seth Green one, where he's like in the airport doing the hacky hacky thing, and he's got all the cameras. You can do that. Like, you, like Hollywood was right. Who knew? But they were right like 15 years in the past. Like 15 years ago, we're throwing you know, bottles at the TV saying, no, that's BS. That doesn't happen in real life. And here we are 20 years later saying, well, now they're actually right. Now I got to eat crow. So... Um, and on, from the blue team side, you can do the same thing, right? So let's say, let's say you're on the blue team and um, you have, uh, you're in a leased office in a building and you take security seriously. Uh, and if you do, thumbs up, because not everyone does. Um, you want, uh, you know, you want to give 110%. You're like, I want to do more than the bare minimum. Uh, I want to see when the red team is coming, because like one of the big gold stars you can wear as a blue teamer is catching the red team, right? So if you can catch the red team, you're in good shape. Uh, so uh, you want to catch the red team, uh, you add into your sim who's talking to the cameras because who else is going to talk to me and maybe Jason and a couple other people are going to be the ones that are like, we're after the cameras because we're, we're crazy people. So you find, you find that stuff in your, in your PCAPs and in your logs, uh, you're off to a good start because the minute somebody starts going after the cameras, like no employee sitting in the sales floor or like nobody in the design area is going to care about the cameras for the building. Like only us crazy people will. So it's a very big, it's like shooting a flare in the air. Yeah, the red team's on the land and they're looking for stuff. Um, but yeah, so from the blue team side of things, you can use the exact same mechanic, like 100% congruency there to say, I'm going to imbibe RTSP streams and pipe them into our own system. And then you can do really cool things. You can say like, we have a front door camera and we can see that a person badged in, but the, the, uh, the person is not someone that we recognize and the badge they used is a, um, assigned to an employee that's on vacation in Tahiti right now. Hmm. Interesting. So whereas otherwise uh, you maybe not have you may not have access to the badge readers or you may not have access to the camera infrastructure. So like things get wild really fast when you start taking like stuff in meat space and correlating it with stuff in like packet space. Um, uh, and and I was it's 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 pleasing to say that like, cool, I fa accidentally stumbled across a thing that'll let you do that. So like, I encourage everyone, if you want to mess with this stuff, uh, go play with Shinobi, add some cameras to it. Um, if you can find the cameras in your own businesses, do this and see what happens. Because, you know, the world's your oyster at that point. Um, th these are things that like, well, so I, I discovered a really uh, amusing quote, a really poignant one recently. With, with, uh, let's see if I can recite it from memory correctly. It's... Uh, uh, the best swordsman in the world doesn't have to fear the second best swordsman in the world. The best swordsman in the world has to fear the fool because you have no idea what the fool is going to do. So from a technical standpoint, we're, you know, most of us, we are, I'm a self-proclaimed dork, uh, we tend to try to solve for the second best swordsman in the world. We try to solve for O-days. We try and solve for ML AI based solutions that are powered by 400 blockchains, eight hamsters, and four quantum computers that are supposed to like magically wave you know, a wand and solve for every possible variant of memory corruption and stuff like that. And like you're up here working and they're like, I've spent $25 million on this research to stop nation state threats doing all this blah, 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 blah. And I'm over here on your camera that's got admin, admin as the creds watching your teams do the thing. And I'm like, oh, so they're going to this. Oh, I just overheard where they were going for lunch. Maybe I'll meet them there. Like... The, the things that we're solving for from a technical perspective tend to be really, really complex and really cool sounding and really great. But like where the problems are tend to be in like acid inventory and like what's on your perimeter and when was the last time, you know, you patched to Apache struts, for example. So um, play with it. It's a lot of fun. It gets wild pretty fast. And with that, uh, I'm, I think I'm a minute over, but uh, if I have time for, yeah, uh, do I have time for questions? Or? Yeah, I think we have time for yeah. uh, one or two. Cool. Any Anyone? questions, guys? No? Come on, don't be shy. Must be someone. Yeah, we're, we're, I'm, I'm American, so I'm spoiled by having uh, uh, audiences that interact and throw things and shout. So, like, <laughs> please don't be shy. No? Anyone? Oh, well, uh, cool. if not, you can always find Dan. Oh, we got oh, Jason. Fire one ready. 
Oh, Orbital. Orbital is a platform that we're building. So uh, we started uh, my company, Phobos Group, as a services company, but we're pivoting to doing a, uh, a, a platform. So Orbital is a thing that we built that does um, like hardcore enumeration of perimeters. So like you aim this at a company and it'll find uh, perimeter infrastructure that maybe folks don't know about uh, or perimeter infrastructure that other tools say doesn't have any known bugs or known CVEs, but maybe it's like the text says click here to complete your WordPress installation which you'll look at that and say, well, that's instant shells, but because there's no CVE associated with it, like all the other tools will say that it's not a problem. So we built a thing because we thought like fundamentally, for example, like the way that we do um, vulnerability management hasn't changed in 20 years. Like 20 years ago when I was using Retina's EI, the technique for doing vulnerability assessment was like connect to a port, grab a banner, and then string match what's in that banner to like stuff to see if there's a known exploit. We're still doing that, and it's been more, been more than 20 years. So we were like, well, that's super old. We're going to try another way. So that's our, our, our attempt to try and move the needle. But yeah, thanks for asking. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. Cheers. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. That's awesome. <laughs>